What's happening guys? Welcome to a how to play video. And in this video I will be running through the basic how to rules for Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game by Games Workshop. Now as many many of you know this is my first love in wargaming and I think it will always be my first love. Um, I absolutely adore this game, always have done. Um, love everything about it, the rule system, the miniatures, the setting, every single thing and I think Games Workshop have done it absolute justice. Um, so what I want to do is basically just run through the basic rules on how to play because I know there's still a lot of people out there who've never played it or used to play it a long long time ago and came away from it for whatever reason, moved on to other things um, and they're still not very familiar with the new rule set. So the new rule set's not a massive change, um, there's, there's, the, the core mechanics are still there, um, I think it's just been made a lot more interesting and been brought a lot more up to date. So let's see what we're going to get up to. So there's three main ways to play Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game and the first way and the most fun way for me personally is narrative play. In narrative play you play out scenarios, you recreate scenes from the movies or the books uh, and you use the miniatures that you've spent a lot of time painting um, and sometimes you can change the course of history in these battles. The second way is open play where basically you and your pal or your pals just get everything out on the table uh, and play with whatever you've got. Um, this is a great way just to sort of get a good feel for the game and work out what each character and each uh, monster or hero can do. The third and most common way to play, especially on the tournament scene, is matched play, where each uh, warrior or hero um, has a profile uh, with a points cost attached to it, and you both build up your armies uh, to a certain points cost, so you both could be playing 500 points, 600 points, 700 points, um, and you choose your armies using the army books uh, and build the strongest, most deadliest force that you can to slay your opponent on the battlefields of Middle Earth. When setting up your boards to play, if you're playing narrative, uh, nine times out of ten you will build a board that represents a, a part of Middle Earth or a scene from one of the movies that you've seen. Uh, you might be battling in Bree or on Lake Town or in the forests of Mirtwood um, and you have great fun doing this. When it comes to match play, it's the common thing to set up the board with about 75% terrain. Um, that way it gives you plenty of options um, and you can use the terrain tactically to try and outmaneuver your opponent. The rules, which we'll be going over in this video, are there to help you play the game on an, an even keel, if you like. It keeps everyone playing off the same rule set and gives you the opportunity to try and outwit your opponents uh, and build your armies so that you can beat your opponent on the battlefield in a fair manner. Every model in the game has what we call a profile. In this profile you will find that specific model's characteristics. The characteristics are as follows. The first characteristic on your profile is the move characteristic. For men uh, it's normally 6 inch, if it's a cavalry model they might be able to move up to 10 inches and if they're a shorter model with smaller legs obviously, like a dwarf, it might be 5 inches or 4 inches but you go to goblins or hobbits. The second characteristic is the fight value and that's denoted by the letter F. Now this tells you how proficient your warrior is in the art of combat. Uh, so you'll have two numbers in this, you'll have your first number which is their fight value, then there'll be a slash and a second number. The second number is the minimum number that you need to roll on a d6 for that character if he's shooting in the shoot phase. Next we have the strength characteristic. The higher this strength is, denotes how strong that character is. So you'll find that monsters have much higher strength than say a man or a, a, a goblin. Um, again, the higher this number is, the higher the chance you have of injuring your opponent. From there we move on to defence. This tells you how tough your opponent is, whether they're wearing armour and how resilient they are and how easily they can fend off attacks from their opponents. Next we have attacks. Attacks number represents the amount of dice you roll in the attacks for that model. So the more heroic that model is, the better the fight that model is, they tend to have a higher attacks characteristic. Your really strong heroes tend to have a characteristic of three, whereas your normal foot troops would have a characteristic of one and would only roll one dice in their fight. We then move on to wounds, denoted by the W. Uh, this pretty self-explanatory tells you how many wounds this character can take. Uh, once that wound tally hits zero, they are removed from play and are counted as being dead or basically just 
incapacitated. And finally on the normal profiles we have courage which is denoted by the letter C. Now courage represents how brave this warrior is. The higher it is the more chance they have of sticking around when it's getting towards the end of the battle and you have to take things like courage checks or if they want to charge a terrifying model which we'll come to later on uh, the higher courage they have the better chance they have of passing this test. Now when we move on to named characters and heroes and things like that we have an extra three characteristics on the profile. These are Might, Will and Fate, noted by M, W and F, with a shield with a figure inside it. These are special characteristics that a hero can use in the game to change the outcome of certain things, but we'll come to that later on. So sticking with profiles for the moment, the first thing that you'll find on there is the uh, character's name or what type of character they are, uh, along with their points value. You'll need this when building your armies um, and you will also need to know whether it is just a normal foot troop or a hero because some of them you may be able to take one of. You'll also find underneath the name certain keywords. These keywords will represent certain things like special rules that are associated with this type, this type of profile or what faction they're from etc. But again we'll come on to that later in the video. Alongside that you'll also find out where your hero um, or character sits on the heroic tier table. Uh, this sort of denotes you know, different things, mainly how many troops can follow this certain character or hero into battle. Again, this is something that we will cover later in the video. There's also a section for additional rules. There's many, many different additional rules um, and what you'll find is you, as you play the game more, you'll become more familiar with these, but basically they're things like how this certain character may affect uh, count towards the bow limit or have a certain area of effect and inspire the warriors around him and things like that. We can also find the war gear which is pretty much as it states what the warriors carry in uh, so what weapons they can use in battle. Moving on to heroic actions uh, this tells us which heroic actions that this particular character has access to uh, as well as the normal heroic actions um, which I'll go down in more detail uh, later on in the video. There's also an option section, uh, this certain uh, individual may be able to take a horse which you have an option for or extra war gear like shields and spears or crossbows and things like that and it will tell you here the things that are available to him or her. There's also special rules in there, so obviously characters, very heroic people in Middle Earth may have certain special rules which help you relate this little miniature on a table to the uh, heroic things that you've seen happening on the TV screen or on the cinema screen um, and these are very very important when it comes to your heroes. And last but not least some of them will have magical powers, a list of magical spells that they have access to. You will only need to worry about this once we start going on to magic and wizards and things like that um, but it is an integral part of the game once you start getting into it. Middle Earth Strategy Battle game is best played when you're playing good versus evil, but you are not limited to play good versus evil. You may be playing at a tournament where you have a good army and you're pitted against another good army, that's fine. I always find personally that when you're playing for fun at home or against your pals at the gaming hall, playing good versus evil is where you get the most from this game. One full turn of Middle Earth Strategy Battle game is played out through different phases. In each phase, one player will go first, followed by the second, then you'll move on to the next phase. The player that has priority will always go first in each phase, unless a heroic action is called, which will stump him and will basically jump the queue and get to go first. So the first phase in Middle Earth Strategy Battle game is the priority phase. In the priority phase, both players will roll off with one dice. The player that rolls the highest has priority for that turn. Second phase is the move phase. The player with priority will move all his models that he needs to move or wants to move. Once he's finished, he will let his opponent know and the opponent will then move all theirs. Thirdly, we have the shoot phase. Same rules as before, the player who has priority gets to shoot their models first. Once they're finished, they declare they're finished and then the opposing player gets to shoot with any models that they wish to shoot with. It's worth noting at this stage, but we will cover it later on, that in Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, you do play using true line of sight. That means that if you can see a model, you can shoot it. Now if it's partly concealed, there will be in the ways, again which we'll cover later, but it's true line of sight for shooting. The fourth phase is the fight phase. In the fight phase, any models that are in base-to-base -base contact will have hand-to-hand -hand combat. The player who has priority will choose the order of the combats. The final phase of the turn is the end phase. In the end phase you will work out any things like rolls that need to be made for any models that may be paralysed and things like that, or removing any tokens and dice from the gaming area so you can start fresh on your next turn. 
what I'll do now is I'll uh, point the camera down at the gaming board and I'll just quickly go through the phases uh, in a little bit more detail so you can visually see how they're played out. As we said previously for priority both players will roll a single die and the highest roll will have priority for that turn. Good player rolls a dice, evil player rolls a dice. Evil player rolls a 2, the good player rolls a 1, so the evil player has priority for this turn. As evil has priority, Sid and Bill's ruffians will all move forward full 6 inch allocation as in their profile. Except for the two bowmen closest to the camera, they will stand still as they wish to shoot in the shoot phase. Once the evil side has fulfilled all his movement in the movement phase that he wishes to do, we move over to the good player who will move their models. So the good player's moved all his models, leaving the far bowman unmoved to get some shots off. The evil player decides that his two ruffian bowmen will target Farmer Maggot. The first thing he has to do is check that they're within range, which they are, a normal bow is 24 inches and he is well in. The second thing he'll do is check his line of sight, which we'll do now. As we can see, there is a bush in between the Ruffian Bowman and Farmer Maggot, so they will have to take an in the way test. The first roll they need to do is roll to see if they hit. They have a shoot value of 5, which means they need to roll a 5 up to make sure they get the shot off successfully. They roll a 5 and a 2, which means one is successful, one is not. The successful shot now needs to roll an in the way for the bush. A bush is classed as a 3 plus to get past on the in the way chart in the main rule book, so we need a 3 up to get through the bush. The bowman rolls a 1 for the in the way and doesn't make it through the bush. Farmer Maggot lives to fight another day. The good player now chooses to use the two hobbit bowmen who haven't moved to fire at the ruffians which are marching towards them at a quick pace. The ruffians are in range and the hobbits have a clear line of sight. They have a 3 up shoot value, so they need 3 or higher on their dash rolls. That's a hit with both dice. We now roll to wound. It's a strength 2 bow against defence 3 men. We check the wound chart and we can see we need 5s to roll for wounds. The good player decides that both shots will be going into the ruffian at the front. And he rolls a 6 and a 4, which means one of the shots was successful and kills the ruffian with the whip. The ruffian is now removed from play. There are no models in combat, so the combat phase is skipped. We move on to the end phase where there's nothing to tie up or check, so we'll move on to turn 2. Turn 2 priority, good roll of 5, evil roll of 2, which means the hobbits get priority this turn. Having moved a majority of his models, the good player now wishes to move the hobbits on the lower part of the screen. Now as we can see, these hobbits are behind a bush, so to move forward they need to take a jump test to see if they can make it over this bush and carry on moving. The way a jump test works is if there's any terrain, fallen debris, bushes, fallen trees, etc. in the way of a model where he wants to move, as long as that is less than the height of the model, he may take a jump test to see if he can traverse it. You would normally move your model part of their move into base contact with the obstacle. Seeing as some of these models are already in base contact with the bush, we'll move straight into the roll for the jump test. If you look in your rule book, you'll see a jump table. You roll a d6. On the roll of a 1, your model stumbles and falls. The model does not cross the obstacle, but instead ends its movement for that turn. On the roll of a 2 to 5, success. The model successfully clambers over the obstacle and reaches the other side. Place your model on the other side of the obstacle with its base touching it. The model may move no further this move phase. However, if you roll a 6, he effortlessly bounds across. This model vaults across the obstacle with ease and may even complete its movement up to its maximum move distance. So we'll start with Baldo Tulpen, who will take his roll first to see if he can get over the bush. Baldo has rolled a 3, so he may cross the bush but must stop on the other side in base contact. Now we'll roll for the archer who is already in base contact. Success! The archer has rolled a 6, he may move his full move distance. The hornblower will now move into base contact with the bush and then take a test, so he already has to use an inch from his move allowance. He'll now also roll to see if he can jump the bush. He rolls a 4, which means he does make it, but he must stop on the other side in base contact. As we can see, the way over this bush now is blocked by Baldo and the Hornsman, so the other two archers are going to attempt to jump the bush to get into Farmer Maggot's field. 
They roll a 5 and a 1, which means one makes it over to the other side. Unfortunately, the other one has to stay where he is on this side of the bush. And that is all of the Hobbit's movement. We'll now move the ruffians. As we can see to the top of the picture, the ruffian with the cleaver has charged two hobbits, a hobbit sheriff and a hobbit bowman. On the bottom half of the screen, the two ruffian bowmen have both moved. One has charged a hobbit archer, whereas the other ruffian has moved half his distance, which will still allow him to shoot with a penalty in this turn. Bill Fernie, Sid Briarthorn, and the three other ruffians are all going to attempt to jump the bush and charge into the hobbits in Farmer Maggot's field. I'll roll them now and we'll come back and tell you the results. Unfortunately, Sid didn't even make it over the bush. Bill did make it over the bush but had to stop. One of the ruffians also made it over the bush and had to stop. But two rolled sixes, both charging into hobbits within their move range. The topmost ruffian charged into two hobbits, followed up by the ruffian with the club who also charged one of the hobbits that the previous ruffian had already charged. So that is the end of the move phase. We now move into the shoot phase, and because the hobbits do have priority, the hobbits get the option to shoot first. So we have two hobbits which are unengaged uh, towards the bottom of the screen. Now, because they had to take a jump test, and for the, because of their result, they're classed as moving full, so they cannot shoot. Now, we do have a hobbit to the top of the screen who hasn't moved yet and is eligible to shoot this turn. After surveying the battlefield, we can see that the only eligible target is the ruffian bowman to the bottom half of the board. He is in, within range, so the hobbit will take the shot. Unfortunately, the hobbit rolled a 2, thus failing to get a shot off. That being the only good model that was eligible to shoot this turn, we now move over to the evil player's shoot phase. Now, because the ruffian moved, he does get a plus 1 penalty to his shoot value. So he normally has a shot value of 5 plus needing a 5 or a 6 to get a shot off successfully. He now, because of moving half his move distance, has to roll a 6. The ruffians decided to take a shot at the hornblower of the hobbits. Success, he's rolled a 6. That is a successful shot. There's no in the ways and nothing like that, so we're now rolled to wound. Strength 2 bow against a defence 2 hobbit needs 4s to wound. And the ruffian has rolled a 5. That takes out the hobbit hornblower. With all the shooting complete in this phase, we'll now move into the combat phase, and it'll be the hobbits that decide the order of combat. So the hobbit player has decided to play the combat out at the top of the screen. We have two hobbits against one ruffian, one hobbit sheriff and one hobbit bowman. So each of these models both have an attack characteristic of one. So in this combat, the ruffian will get to roll one dice and the hobbits will get to roll two because there's two hobbits. In normal circumstances, the ruffians would have the edge over hobbits when it comes to fight value. In this fight, because we have a hobbit sheriff, he has a fight value of 3. He's the higher fight value, which means upon rolling a draw, the hobbits will take the win in the combat. As we can see, the hobbits roll a 5 highest, and the ruffian rolls a 4. So the hobbits will take this combat. During combat, the loser must back away a full inch. Now the loser has backed away, the good model can strike blows. So the hobbits have a strength value of 2, whereas the ruffian has a defence value of 3. Again, we check the wound chart and we can see that the hobbits will need 5s to wound the ruffian. The hobbits roll well and the ruffian is taken down. We now move on to the next combat. We can see here that one of the ruffians is actually in base contact with two hobbits. In instances like this, you have to separate the fights. It's always good practice to leave a small gap between where once they were touching, thus becoming two single one-on-one -on -one fights rather than a multiple combat. So the Hobbit player again decides to fight the combat furthermost to the top of the board. We have the Hobbit Sheriff in the red coat and the yellow hat against the Drunkard Ruffian. Again, both players have an attack characteristic of one, so it'll be one dice against one dice. They'll roll off now. Here we see the Ruffians rolled higher than the Hobbit, so the Ruffian wins the combat. The Hobbit must now back away a full inch. Now the Hobbit has backed away, the Ruffian will strike blows. So this time the Ruffians are strength three and the Hobbit's defence is two. This means the ruffian needs to roll a 4 to inflict a wound on the hobbit. The ruffian succeeds easily and takes a hobbit off the board. We now move on to the last combat of this phase. It's almost an identical combat to the previous one. Here we can see the hobbit sheriff in the blue coat and yellow hat. He's fighting the ruffian with the club. Both players roll off and it's a draw. Both players roll a 4. In this situation the hobbit sheriff has the higher fight value. So he takes the combat. The ruffian must back away an inch. Now the Hobbit Sheriff must roll to wound. 
Again, the Hobbit Sheriff needs fives to wound the ruffian. Unfortunately this time, the Hobbit only rolled a three. This means the ruffian is safe for this turn. With all the combats played out, that is the end of the phase. We'd move into the end phase. There's nothing to roll here. There's no one to roll to see if they need to stand up or if they're still paralysed anymore or anything like that. We will come to that later on in the series. So how did you find that, guys? We've come to the end of the first video. I'm going to do follow-up videos where we explain in more detail the more intricate bits and bobs from the rules. We'll talk about heroes. We'll talk about using might, will and fate. We'll talk about magic. We'll talk about monsters, special strikes and things like that. I wanted to do this video just to get the basics out there because these are the things that you need to master. These are the things that you kind of need to know um, as easy as tying your shoelaces because once you've mastered these and you're not constantly thinking you're getting things right in these simple parts of the game, that's when you can start honing your skills into the later things. So let us know what you think in the comments below. Um, let us know what you're looking forward to seeing us covering in the next videos. Uh, yeah, and hope to see you guys in episode two of How to Play Middle-earth strategy battle game.